want you to hit me as hard as you can. While many filmmakers have been humbled by the critical and commercial calamity of a sophomore slump, Richard Kelly's Southland Tales reserves a special seat at the table. After the eventual cult following of his feature debut Donnie Darko, there was considerable anticipation for Kelly's follow-up, but his intricate sci-fi saga Southland Tales would be an apparent case of Murphy's Law on steroids, including a devastating can screening, arduous re-editing, and an eventual whimper of a release. Let's take a stroll down Venice Beach and find out what the f*** happened to this movie. In 2001, young filmmaker Richard Kelly made his feature debut with the indie Donnie Darko, a serpentine sci-fi thriller with Jake Gyllenhaal as a troubled teen trapped in a time loop. Its premiere at the Sundance Film Festival was... Uh, actually a bit of a disaster. The movie nearly ended up going direct to cable, before its limited theatrical release was finally secured. But between a low screen count, the story's complexity, and the discomfort of a movie prominently featuring a plane crash released shortly after 9-11, it was a box office misfire. Depressed but undeterred, Kelly continued writing scripts, but struggled to land his next gig. He was going to make his second directing effort on a $15 million sci-fi movie he had rewritten, but that project collapsed at the last minute. That movie, Knowing, would later get made and released in 2009 with Nicolas Cage and director Alex Proyas, and a significantly larger budget. Meanwhile, Donnie Darko had begun to find its own audience after a home video release in 2002. The movie was developing a sizable cult following and Richard Kelly found himself with some Hollywood heat and an opportunity to make the project that he had been swirling about in his head, Southland Tales. Thanks for watching Joe Blow Videos. If you enjoy our shows, please like and subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Now, back to the show. Kelly had written an initial draft of the script shortly before the 9-11 attacks. At that time, it was more of a small scale comedy, which producer Sean McKittrick later described as in the vein of a Robert Altman movie. The early version centered on a group of failed actors who fabricate an elaborate con against a major action movie star. But after 9-11, Kelly's perspective and approach to the material changed. His updated Southland tales would still include a skewering of Hollywood, but shifted to a commentary on propaganda and product placement, and the balance between civil liberties and homeland security. Kelly described the movie as a, quote, tapestry of ideas related to some of the biggest issues we're facing right now. Alternative fuel or the increasing obsession with celebrity and how the celebrity now intertwines with politics. For inspirations, Kelly cited Kiss Me Deadly, Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, and Terry Gilliam's Brazil, along with the sensibilities of Andy Warhol and sci-fi author Philip K. Dick. In fact, Kelly later admitted that he intentionally began layering in more of Philip K. Dick elements after they had proved popular in Donnie Darko and its director's cut. Although, allowing the success of one story to dictate another based on popular public reception may not have been the best creative decision. This seems like a good time to attempt a plot synopsis for Southland Tales. On July 4th, 2005, the cities of Abilene and El Paso, Texas are annihilated by nuclear bombs, prompting World War III and a revival of the mandatory military draft. For safety and security, the Patriot Act has essentially stripped the United States citizens of nearly all of their privacy. Due to fuel shortage, an alternate energy source called Karma Fluid is produced by a German company, but the byproduct seems to be problematic for the space-time continuum. But wait, there's more. Cut to dystopian 2008 Los Angeles, also known as the Southland, where amnesic action star Boxer Centaros becomes a wanted man for writing an eerily prescient screenplay. Along the way to the apparent end of the world, Boxer interacts with several colorfully sorted characters like psychic porn star turned reality show host Chris Denau, power-hungry villain Baron Von Westphalen, and possible identical twins Roland and Ronald Tavernier, not to mention various politicians, henchmen, 
neo-Marxists, and homicidal cops. When it came time to cast the film, Kelly made a conscious effort to recruit actors that he felt were unfairly pigeonholed, seeking to expose their hidden talents by casting them against type. Leading the way was Dwayne Johnson, who might now be one of the most bankable movie stars and was then still transitioning from the world of professional wrestling. Kelly met with Johnson in early 2005 and described it as, quote, like love at first sight. He immediately recognized the potential, saying, quote, he had all this extraordinary training in the professional wrestling ring. There were a lot of people who, at the time, would not take him seriously because of that. But I thought it was a gift. Kelly pitched him the story and showed designs of the movie's mega Zeppelin centerpiece done by legendary concept artist Ron Cobb, and Johnson instantly jumped on board the project. The star and director took deliberate steps to diverge from Johnson's confident wrestling persona, leading to the character's cowering and finger twitching. Further underscoring his evolution as an actor, Southland Tales would also be Johnson's first starring role to shed his The Rock moniker. The sprawling cast was filled out with an offbeat ensemble. For the role of Chris Denau, which Kelly described as Jenna Jameson meets Ariana Huffington, the director considered Jessica Biel and Jennifer Love Hewitt before casting former vampire slayer Sarah Michelle Gellar. Johnson's rundown co-star, Sean William Scott, would play, separately but together, a police officer and a kidnap victim. Former SNL regulars Nora Dunn, John Lovitz, Sherry O'Terry, Janine Garofalo, and Amy Poehler would be joined by familiar character actors like Wallace Shawn, Curtis Armstrong, Zelda Rubinstein, and John Larroquette. Also among the interconnected cast of characters was pop star Mandy Moore as Boxer's wife and Justin Timberlake as pilot Abilene, a scarred war veteran who narrates the movie. Christopher Lambert would play a gun dealer, a role initially intended for Oliver Stone. Kelly would bring back his Donnie Darko actors Beth Grant and Holmes Osborne for key roles. And there's Bai Ling, Miranda Richardson, Will Sasso, and director Kevin Smith in heavy makeup for some reason. From various resources, the production collected a budget of around $17 million, which seems quite large for such a strange cinematic brew, but also not nearly enough for the ambitions of Kelly, who later said, quote, We needed 50, but we got 17, which was a major undertaking. Universal Studios would retain distribution rights. Principal photography commenced in August 2005, shooting all over Los Angeles, but with much of the film set around the Venice boardwalk. With such big plans and an extensive cast, but on a comparatively small budget, the crew would exhaust themselves hustling to complete filming in the allotted 29 days. Kelly, quote, was trying to keep the roller coaster on its tracks, leading to small windows of time to shoot scenes on location. One of those windows was with Justin Timberlake, who was only available for one day of shooting. His few hours expanded out to 16, while Kelly added more material and captured the musical fantasy sequence set to the killer song, All These Things That I've Done, which it should be noted, Kelly rehearsed and shot without first securing music rights, or even finding out if the budget could allow it, much to the chagrin of the producers. But luckily, he showed a cut of the scene to the band, who loved it so much that they agreed to license the song for a fee the production could actually afford. Principal photography on Southland Tales concluded at the end of October that year, leading to a long and laborious editing process that provided its own set of escalating problems. Out of perhaps youthful exuberance and wide-eyed optimism, Kelly sent the organizers of the 2006 Cannes Film Festival a very rough cut of the film, fully expecting it to be denied entry. Much to his surprise, the organizers loved it and invited him to enter it in competition for the Palme d'Or, the festival's most prestigious award. Kelly quickly agreed and hastily stopped the editing process, which still required a number of digital effects particularly for the climactic Mega Zeppelin sequence. Perhaps assuming that the can audience would receive the unfinished film as positively as the organizers had, Kelly agreed to premiere Southland Tales at Cannes in May 2006. This would be a rude awakening. 
At a punishing length of 160 minutes, the version screened at Cannes was met with a resoundingly negative reception. With an average score of 1.5 out of 5 in all of the daily screenings, the film was the lowest scored entry in the entire festival that year. At the time, Kelly called the ordeal, quote, a very painful experience on a lot of levels, and feared his career might very well be over at just 30 years old. Fifteen years later, Kelly further reflected on the experience, saying, quote, We were all completely nuts for even trying to pull it off. It was maybe destined to fail. We felt like we were minimizing the risk for such a provocative and complex project. The can response was almost like a mortal wound. We'd been stabbed with a knife, and were just trying not to bleed to death. Following the catastrophic can premiere, Universal backed out of its U.S. distribution deal. As a result, Sony Pictures picked up the rights to the film, although Universal would retain certain international territories. One small problem. The movie was still unfinished. After Cam, Kelly tried, and failed, to get more money for digital effects, ultimately turning to art students from Chapman University to piece things together. Another misstep for Kelly after Can was proceeding with a unique but overly ambitious marketing campaign. Believe it or not, his dense story was intended to be even denser. Kelly had originally conceived Southland Tales as an interactive nine-part multimedia experience, with the first six chapters told in graphic novels that would eventually lead into the film, which would reveal the final three chapters. Kelly has expressed that the movie makes so little sense to people because they had not read the preceding chapters to fully contextualize events in the film. The plan was to release monthly novels up until the movie's release, with a corresponding website as both promotional tool and visual interactive experience. Once that project became too lofty, Kelly whittled the graphic novel chapters down to just three, which he worked on concurrently while making the movie a schedule he said stretched him to the edge of sanity. The books did not get published before the movie's release, but Kelly acknowledges the folly of his experiences, saying, quote, It was definitely reliant upon the graphic novel transmedia prequel. I was perhaps incredibly naive or foolish enough to think that we could get people to read these books and buy these graphic novels, and that I could get a distributor to really get behind this. I take all the blame for that but it's my nature. For the theatrical release of the film, significant edits were made after the apocalyptic Cannes premiere, and the result of that additional tinkering would debut at Fantastic Fest in September 2007. After another tepid audience response, the movie languished yet again, leading to anxious concerns for Kelly that his movie set in 2008 would be a period piece by the time it finally came out. Ultimately, Destination Films and Samuel Goldwyn partnered to distribute a limited release, and Southland Tales opened in just 63 theaters across the U.S. and Canada on November 16, 2007. Audiences were not prepared for, or really interested in, the complicated comedy satire. Relative to its budget, the movie would be one of the biggest box office flops in cinematic history, grossing just $275,000 against a production cost of more than 17 million. The film also confounded many critics, who used terms like frustratingly incoherent and abstract crap, although others did praise Kelly's austere ambition despite the jumbled results, even calling it a maddening masterpiece. In the years since the release of Southland Tales, Kelly has only directed one other feature film, The Box, an adaptation of a Richard Matheson short story. It was Kelly's only effort that grossed more than its budget at the box office. Just barely. That's not to say the filmmaker hasn't been busy. Writing projects like a biopic of Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling, and a possible Donnie Darko sequel that was prompted by a conversation with James Cameron. And much like Donnie Darko, Southland Tales has also found a substantial appreciation since its release. And Given the real-life events since Kelly made the movie, in many ways, his vision of the future, and satirical spin on corporations and conspiracies and politics, 
it doesn't actually seem all that outrageous. Despite the initial failure of the film to resonate, he says the movie is, quote, the thing that I'm most proud of, and I feel like it's sort of the misunderstood child. He also stated that, quote, getting to work with all those actors was the greatest experience of my life. Kelly recently revisited the movie for a restoration Blu-ray release, complete with a new narration from Justin Timberlake. And even after all that, he still considers it a work in progress, saying, quote, neither the can nor the theatrical cut is fully satisfying in my mind. So he isn't entirely done with Southland Tales, and hopes to somehow continue or expand the story as a prequel or streaming series, even possibly figuring out a way to bring back Dwayne Johnson, now one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. As he said in a 2021 interview, quote, I'm not going to ever give up on it. I'm going to keep pushing for it for the rest of my life or until everyone gets too old. As it seems, even after such a difficult journey, apparently there are still more Southland tales to tell. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments and thanks for watching.